Welcome to the Elevate Everyday Podcast. I'm your host, Kate Junkerth, and I own Fitness Junkie Training, and we specialize in helping busy male professionals get in the best shape of their life while working smarter, not harder. And today, I'm joined by a badass guest, another fitness coach, and we had a good time connecting before the podcast. This guy has been through a lot. Um, he's been through basically hell and back. Um, and I'm excited for him to share his story with you guys. And I know that some of you guys that may have been through some past traumas or just some rough points in your life and you're trying to get back on track fitness wise, I think this is really going to resonate with you. So thank you, Mitch, for being on the podcast, sir. And uh, let's dive right into it. So I know, like I said, you've been through hell and back. You've been through a lot, man. Um, and now you're a fitness coach yourself. So why don't you just share with us kind of your story that you were sharing with me and kind of the struggles you've been through? Yeah, I will give you, and first off, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it, man. I'm excited to uh, to jump in. Um, long story, um, lots of twists and turns. So I'm going to give the quickest version that I can, sure. and then we can pick it apart if that makes sense for you. How about that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right, cool, man. So uh, to the audience, I guess my journey started when I was about 20 years old, traveling in Europe, um, drinking a lot for the uh, World Cup of a second story window tbi um started having panic attacks and insomnia after that developed autoimmune disease um a couple years later moved into a house that had black mold um clemson university said it's one of the worst cases of black mold they've seen um heavy metals diabetes um i was overweight and i realized i had to make some choice changes I, I did i worked with a doctor started doing functional medicine I worked with a detox specialist, detox the heavy metals, detox the Lyme. I don't know if I said Lyme disease, um, mold, detox that stuff. Got better, fell in love with health and wellness, wanted to share that with other people. Left my uh, you know, corporate job after about seven years um, doing that and started coaching, started doing my health coaching business. I had a chiropractor that I partnered with in the beginning, moved to a bigger city, and I was going to see one of my clients in this uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, and got hit by a dump truck. Jeez. So I had post -con post concussion syndrome for about a year, and then I got three long haul COVIDs in a row, mm. and um, that destroyed my gut, my hormones. Had chronic fatigue, couldn't get out of bed, you name it, and just kind of went through what I would call the dark night of the soul. Wow. And um, you know, amazingly, I've had a, a hell of a transform a transformation here in the last twelve months that I feel like I'm the, I feel like I feel better than I did when I was twenty years old. That's awesome. What what was the like? What was the thing that switched? What like when was it like? All right, what when did the turning point start? And like what what kind of started you getting into the the transformation from all that? Well, there's so many turning points, right? Yeah. And and there's so many things that have helped me along my my journey. And and that's I think what makes me a good coach is is searching for answers and and really getting penny figging myself. Yep. and and seeing what works and what doesn't and i'd say everything moved the needle in it and at different times uh, along this i'm 37 17 year journey you know depending on when you spoke with me and if anybody goes back and goes on my website and sees some old podcasts there's i'm evangelical about things like you know the ketogenic diet it helped me uh reverse uh diabetes as did fasting i was really passionate about that until i did that too much and ran my hormones into the ground and right. um, i'm really passionate about you know, quantum physics and the, and, you know, mindset and manifestation, that was a big turning point, you know, different uh, eating patterns, you know, bringing food back in, getting into exercise, you know, but, but more recently, kind of like we talked about on our call, when I hit my head, I had this belief that something was wrong with me and I had to fix me. Right. And I use the TBI as an excuse for, you know, I can't sleep. I can't this. I am, I am, I am like, right. I'm really, it's a very powerful statement. I am. Right. And um, I had this addiction to getting better, right? It's a healthy addiction, I would say, but I call it an addiction because all of these things that I said, moved the needle, they almost worked. They didn't quite hit the root mm -hmm. until I found recently what I'm really excited about right now is you know, understanding that I had a very dysregulated nervous system um, from years and, and years of trauma and lots of different experiences. I mean, we, we named several uh, just while we were talking. But since I've done that work and started to build regulation in my nervous system, it feels like that is the, the root cause that I've been looking for. And when I 
everything started calming down. Hormones came back. I, right now, I've, in the last uh, year, just this year, I didn't exercise for about four years. I could not. So I've started exercising again. I put on about 20, 25 pounds. I got off of thyroid medicine earlier this year. Right now, I'm weaning off of uh, TRT, testosterone replacement therapy, um, and learning how to sleep again, learning what it feels like to live without anxiety or at least learn how to manage that. So that, that's, what, that's what's been the thing that I'm most excited about right now. Yeah, that's cool. And the, and the nervous system stuff is pretty new to me, like I was talking about with you um, on, our, on our chat beforehand. Uh, but, you know, I've, I've been pretty familiar with like <clears throat> the central nervous system and like priming it for, yeah. for different things. You know, I, I know about like central nervous system fatigue, um, but you're, what you're talking about sounds pretty different. So how, how does someone kind of identify if they've got, you know, nervous system issues or like, you know, things that they can improve upon? Um, how does someone even identify that? Because I wouldn't even know if I had stuff like that, to be honest with you. Uh, and I and I know what you mean. I I completely you know from my understanding the nervous system was not on my radar. And I was, you know, I'm a big fan of like heart rate variability and doing like a, a chest strap and looking at raw data. I, I use that a lot when I've got a, a CrossFit client that's you know hitting the gym six seven days a week and doesn't understand why they've got you know belly fat and they can't sleep at night. Their cortisol is dropped through the roof. Yeah. And so I'll put that on like we can look at it. So. That was my understanding of it as well. And I've certainly experienced CNS fatigue after doing like uh, max squats and stuff like that. <laughs> well, the, the way that I remember it the most, my leg is actually, as we were talking about before the podcast, my legs over here shaking from my uh, um, blood flow restriction training. So that feels like CNS fatigue. But like when I think of CNS fatigue, I ran a, um, and I'll get back to it here in just a minute, the, the question here in a minute, but I ran my first obstacle course race uh, with like two or three days notice. And I'd never ran seven, never done endurance like that. And um, I've always been an explosive athlete. And um, I, I rested like one day and then I went back to the wad and like I got sick. So and, and my my temperature was up and down and, you know, fatigue and got so that to me, that's what that's what nervous system fatigue is. But to answer your question, you know, how do we identify nervous system regulation? Um, my understanding now I'm learning from uh, Irene Lyon. Okay. And uh, she's a trauma specialist, uh, a specialist in somatic experiencing and, and the nervous system. And, and she would say that a dysregu reg dysregulated nervous system is uh, defined by these syndromes and symptoms that are kind of unexplainable, the things that won't go away when you've done a lot of this work and things are just kind of still hanging around things like anxiety, depression, you know, fibromyalgia, autoimmune disease, um, all these diseases and things that are on the rise, right? I think as a, as the human race as a whole is asking for the nervous systems to heal. Now, for me, and this may, may be my reticulator, reticulating activating system, kind of looking for these things, but I see it everywhere. And it was so new to me, um, this, this like regulation, um, one, because I didn't have that, you know, growing up, you know, it, it really, it starts in childhood. And um, yeah, it just comes down to like kind of the mystery illnesses is the way that I look at it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So if you're just kind of like realizing, man, I'm getting these illnesses. I don't know what's going on. It's like, mm -hmm. th this might be something that's, that's happening. Um, you know, like my stuff would always change. Right. So I, if you, if I was working with a Western medical doctor, instead of working with like a functional medicine doctor, I could have been labeled and treated for so many different syndromes and symptoms, if that makes sense, but they would shift. Because right. it's not the, the root is not fixing my diet or getting the right exercise in or, you know, doing a breath work exercise or, you know, all the uh, environmental stimulus like hot and cold, you know, all the, doing all those things and, and I'm still not sleeping. I'm still having anxiety, still like lingering things that are hanging around. Yeah. Okay. So, so how have you now been working on that? Like how, what, what have you changed um, from what you were doing in the past to be able to like help your, your nervous system and, and like start feeling better? Yeah. So, so what Irene teaches, I mean, first off, I work with a professional. I think that's an, important to, uh, to seek that. And, and I will also say that, you know, she says that that's not always needed. Right. So that's where I started. Uh, we have a, a men's health group uh, here in the Raleigh area that a friend, uh, two, a buddy of mine, two buddies of mine and myself started called men on a journey. Right. And so we, anybody that's in the Raleigh area, any of your listeners, we meet on the second Thursday of every month. And, um, I was reading the book, The Body Keeps the Score, 
And, uh, you know, it talks about how trauma gets stored in the body and it affects our health. And I would even say a lot of chronic disease is rooted in, in trauma. And I was sharing a particular experience with the group and they asked a couple of questions and the way that I responded, they pulled me aside and said like, hey, that book you're reading, The Body Keeps the Score, like that's you, man, like you got a lot of trauma. And because they'd been through it as well. And the crazy thing is that I completely skimmed over it, like especially the the childhood part. Like I had a great family growing up that loves me and, you know, I wasn't abused physically or anything like that. And um, so I, I just I just went past that. And yeah. I would say it, it's a cultural thing, right? Like there's so many things that I've learned that were that I thought were OK, that were not OK. Right. And um, the group helped me identify that. And I'm, I'm losing your main question. Let me circle back to that to help me tie bow. What was the original question? Just um, like how how have you okay, been yeah. working on? I got you. So how do we how do we work on that? So I, a professional would be number one. What Irene does that I'm a big fan of, and now starting to integrate with my clients is building capacity. So I'm not necess- I'm not a therapist, you know, I'm not a doctor, but we can learn these neurosensory exercises to learn how to regulate ourselves. It's kind of like learning a new language as an adult if we didn't have that attunement and that regulation as we, we were brought up, right? And so when we don't, we don't have regulation growing up, we're more susceptible to these, these shock traumas like the car accident I was in or falling out of the window. They kind of, you know, one person could have that accident and, and 15 minutes later, they're fine. The other person, their gut's off, their hormones go crazy and they, they can't get out of bed, right? So it's all about how much regulation do you have? And so we can do that just by learning how to, be with our physiology, right? Mm-hmm. So when we have an, an example of that would be like anxiety or depression or insomnia, like those are all negative, unwanted emotions, right? And so typically, I know at least me, speaking from my experience, when I had those, when I had really bad anxiety, when I had insomnia, I would want to run as far away as I could from it. And in actuality, being afraid of our physiology is a part of the problem and, and why it's so hard to heal. What I had to learn was that that physiology, that feeling, that's my best friend. That's the, that's the thing that's letting me know, hey, we need your attention. It is begging for my attention. And when you can befriend that pain and sit with it, you can process. It's almost like that, that survival stress, that dysregulation is, and now I'm going into a little bit of, of trauma therapy and what that's like. Is that okay? Yeah. That's fine. You know, that, that regulation, that anxiety, let's say, that's a bunch of little me's screaming for attention. For example, so say something happened, right? Like, like say somebody's, you know, abusing you, beating you up, right? And you're a kid and you can't, and it's a caregiver potentially, right? So you can't fight, you can't flee. And so the, the system only has one other option and that's to shut down, mm-hmm. right? And so that that means that, that expression of I want to push somebody off, I want to fight, I want to run away, I, I have to shut down instead. And so that expression does not get to complete the loop and it gets stored in our body. And right. so when we build regulation and we learn to sit with that, we learn to process that, we learn to feel our body, we literally have to feel it to heal it, um, then it kind of works itself out on its own. Now, there may be some more uh, big T traumas, there's big T, there's little T um, that need to be worked on with a professional. And so the way that I do it is I am going through Irene's course and I am building capacity and I can go into some examples of what that looks like. And and it's a process. It's, it's regulation, it's safety down to a cellular level. And when I feel safe and I am regulated, now my nervous system is your nervous system wants to heal, right? All that dysregulation, it wants to heal. So now it's like, finally, this dude is finally paying attention to me and doing what I should have done a long time ago. And that with that capacity, they kind of dislodge on their own. Okay. So what I'm kind of getting from that is like, maybe a lot of people put band-aids over what's going on. And oh, yeah. Yeah. Instead of like, going to the root of the issue and like being like, okay, I need to pay attention to what actually my body's going through and like sit with that and then figure out the real solution here. Is that kind of what, what I'm hearing? Oh yeah. I mean, and, and I numbed every single way that I possibly could, you know, uh, before this, and that would be not talking about it. That would be acting like it's not there. That would be exercising myself into a, you know, into a hole or eating or, or, 
alcohol, drugs, you name it. You know, I know that's part of your journey. And I saw something a post you did today where you, or not today, but recently where you said you were seven days sober and one, and one of the, or seven months sober. And one of the uh, big takeaways you had was like using vices for, I don't remember exactly how you said it, but like, it was basically numbing. Like we yeah. use those things to suppress our emotions. And, and that's absolutely um, what a lot of people are doing. 100% man. Yeah. And yeah. So, so yeah, I've just completely cut out alcohol um, and it, I've felt a lot better recently for it. And yeah, we were, we were connecting a little bit on just like some addictions that you've struggled with in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk about is like, how have you been able to, cause this is something I was talking about with another um, coach I had on the podcast recently who struggled with actually cocaine addiction in the past. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, that can be super addictive. Um, but what are some ways that you've been able to kind of improve your dopamine reward systems? Cause a lot of times, you know, you, you kind of wreck those things when you're going through addiction and stuff like that. And then coming out of that, you know, it can be tough. Like what are some ways that you've improved um, just your reward systems, like the natural functioning of your brain and kind of like improve your dopamine systems from, from- well, I mean, I think, uh, I think exercise is huge. Yeah. Uh, for the, you know, the anxiolytic, the antidepressant effect that it has, um, having strong relationships and, you know, people that you can talk to that understand you that aren't going to shit all over you and instead are going to just listen and, and, and hold that space and be, I got so many friends that I can call on. You know, the men's group has been huge, um, you know, eating and taking care of my body and prioritizing sleep. And, um, you know, I'll even throw out, you know, I'm a big fan of cannabis. Um, that's something that's, that's certainly helped. You know, I was on I just recently got off of uh, clodipin, you know, a, a benzodiazepine that I was using to, to help me sleep and um, bringing some of the cannabis back in has been a super, uh, super helpful. I mean, when I think of dopamine, I think of like crossing things off of, of a list, you know, so creating a list and crossing those off and then trying to stay away from social media like that. You know, if, as soon as you wait, big one for me is for dopamine. When, I, when you say that is waking up in the morning and what do we normally do? We go straight to the phone, right? So that programs your brain to, to be, and you're going to get a little hit of dopamine. It's going to probably help you get out of bed. You know, maybe you're laying there and you're kind of trying to get some motivation and you, you hop on social media, you got to see some likes, you see some, some messages from your buddies and you get that dopamine hit. But what are you doing the rest of the day, man? I know I do it. I'm like just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. So I try to, uh, anytime I get bored, you know, so I try to not look at that for the first hour or two uh, waking up and that can be a big, uh, big help for, for dopamine as well. Hundred percent. Yeah, I, I resonate a lot with what you said with crossing off the list. Um, but another thing and exercise. But um, I recently read this book, and I'm about to have a coaching call with my clients um, this week on this topic. Um, so that's why it's just kind of fresh in my brain. Why I wanted to get your take on it um, with your background. Um, but I recently read The Molecule of More, and it's all about dopamine. Super mm-hmm. interesting, mm-hmm. Um, guys listening. Like I would recommend this book for sure. It's it's very eye opening. Um, but what they talk about is like engaging in like long sustained um, things that you're doing uh, instead of like getting quick hits uh, of dopamine. So like exercise, you know, reading a book, like this helps you get dopamine, but it, it, instead of giving you a quick peak and then it crashing, like most dopamine hits that we get from like social media, you know, highly processed foods and stuff like that, or just all the easy ways we get dopamine these days in our society. Um, it, it helped. Like if you're doing reading a book, you know, exercising, going on long walks, like you even mentioned like relationships, like having good conversation, things like that. Like this gives you a, a more sustained level of dopamine. So it rises it, but it's, it sustains. And so it's, it's a much healthier way to, to get your dopamine, you know, and trying to get as much of that as possible, as opposed to just always getting these quick hits from all these yeah. other other ways like a little um a little delayed gratification or um or mental toughness too like and and especially with your line of work one thing i i was i was looking at some ways recently to how to develop mental toughness and one that i really liked i'd love to get your take on this is uh and when you're in the gym and you're doing your workout right you're doing something hard okay we should, of course we enjoy it but it's tough right and so if you're listening to music or a podcast like that's helping you get through it right so the the suggestion was lifting weights in silence. <laughs> yeah, I actually. So if you if you, do you know much about Andrew Huberman? Oh yeah, a little bit. I know who he is. I know his podcast. Yeah. Yeah, he he had a whole one on dopamine, and it was a really interesting one. Um, and 
And one thing that he talked about is like cycling some of these things that we do to like assist our workouts so mm-hmm. that we're not dependent on it. Like even like caffeine or pre-workout to work out, you know, things like that. Like every once in a while, like don't use some of these things. Like he even talked about the music, like every once in a while, don't use the music because you can start becoming dependent on those things for that task that you're trying to do. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. yeah I, I love shaking things up and uh, anything that we become anything that you can't quit for three days, right. is like you're hooked on it. So any, I like to look at things that I'm using as a crutch or leaning on and, and try to, even with caffeine, I'll do that, uh, which I'm definitely due for that right now, but, uh, take, take five days off to kind of let the, um, with adenosine receptors reset. Oh, yeah. And then, and then that coffee, that cup of coffee, when you get back to it, like coffee is such a performance enhancing drug, but yeah. like the way that it should be done is not, not so frequently but like when the training is like competition you throw yeah. down like two three hundred milligrams of caffeine when you hadn't had it and it you're on fire dude oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> same thing I, I do the same thing even with work or like with podcasts whatever i'm doing like whenever i'm trying to like you know be in the zone or like in my state like i i kind of like uh lump these caffeine or whatever it may be you know to, to try to like make myself be in state and, and be in the zone in those in those times so all right then i gotta ask one all right have you taken anything before the podcast and two <laughs> give me your favorite stack for like flow state for flow state yeah so pretty much i would say when i feel my best and we're doing this podcast a little bit later so it i'm not like a hundred percent in that like like perfect zone that but my when i feel the best is in the morning honestly fasted um with with a cup of coffee after you know about an hour to hour and a half maybe even two hours because you want to give it some time um for your cortisol levels uh and like for your adenosine um for to get the most out of your caffeine so you want to wait mm-hmm. hour and a half two hours have that cup of coffee be fasted um you know after drinking a good amount of water you know so so usually around like between 9 and 11 after i've done that like after i've woken up drinking some a good amount of water. Um, I've already started working, you know, I tried to avoid the phone with the likes and social media and I've started working. Um, and I've, then I start sipping my coffee and things are going, things are flowing. That's, that's when I'm in like a really good flow state. So honestly, like fasted combined with coffee being well hydrated, that's when I'm like in the zone and that's when I, <laughs> I feel 100%. like I'm locked in. So yeah, the fasting is a, is a magic tool for, for, uh, focus for brain. and even along those lines, um that's what i took before we hopped on i took a little shot of ketone little ketone ester kind of get, oh, really? get, get the brain going a little bit yeah interesting but, yeah, but my I, favorite one would be um if it's in the morning absolutely caffeine just like you said um and i love kratom and kava mixed together so like uh have you tried feel free i haven't so i don't feel know. free tonic typically kratom is like dosed way too high and it can and, I can, and actually you can get um um some dependency there And so for the listeners, you know, five days a week at max, I probably take it maybe once or twice a week at the most, but I love it for golf. I love it for podcasting, like focus work. Um, And it's got Kratom and it's smaller, very smaller dose of Kratom. And then Kava, which is like a relaxant from the island of Vanatu that's very similar to alcohol without the cognitive decline. And so it's got this weird, like anxiolytic, euphoria, energy feeling and dialed interesting like it you can be silly and cut up and you can like really access different parts of your brain it feels like um and then on the golf course it's just everything's amazing it's like it's my favorite little performance hack is there like a specific brand that you feel, yeah feel free tonic is the feel name free right. tonic okay yeah. well, definitely and, I, and, and like uh, i just do a half of a bottle um, okay. a whole bottle will get you kind of jacked up um <laughs> but uh yeah that ketones some coffee that's my like little focus performance stack. Cool. Well, yeah. sweet, man. Um, so I wanted to get into this other question with you, with you, um, just, you know, you're a little older than me, not that you're old, but <laughs> you're a little older than me. Um, like what's the best way that you would say, um, to train for longevity? I get a lot of clients like asking about that, asking about mobility. Um, it, I'm sure that's part of your journey and part of what you work on with some of your clients. Like, what do you find is the best way to train for longevity? Well, um, you know, the funny thing I think about when lo- with longevity, you know, you've got when we're talking longevity, you got two pathways, right? You got like the mTOR, which is like muscle building and growth, 
And then you've got the AMP-K pathway, which is like breaking down and fasting and autophagy. And, you know, even more recently, uh, the whole industry, you know, a couple of years ago, we were obsessed with like keto and autophagy. And really, we're finding that you can get more autophagy and in, in, uh, in strength training exercises. Like, so a 24-hour fast um, is nice, but you can get the similar benefits, if not more, from doing some good, hard, uh, you know, heavy strength training. Yeah. And so there, it's you got to really get clear on what you want, right? Like, do you want to just eat vegetables and be very low on protein and take a lot of, you know, these, these AMP-K kind of pathway stimulants. And I would say things like, um, I'm, I'm kind of blanking on those, but like berberine and, you know, apple cider vinegar, different glucose disposal agents, things to lower blood glucose. And, you know, you can get into the pharmaceutical realm with that. But like, for me, yeah, and I think Ben Greenfield said this. It's like I don't want to be like cold and libidoless, libidoless at like <laughs> 80 years old. Like at 80 years old, I want to be, you know, keeping up with the 30 and 40 year old guys and still yeah. throwing down hard workouts and eating good food. And so, yeah. I, for me, what I do with my clients is, is I kind of, I do diet variation. And so I, do, I kind of, we were kind of talking about this earlier, and this could be a dopamine thing as well. Like I. I do not like eat, doing the same thing all the time. You know, eat, just like you said, podcasting, my exercise, the, the foods that I'm eating, like I, I, I need variety. I go all in and real hard for a period of time and I master a recipe or an exercise or something fun that I'm doing and then I want something else, right? So I think the way to do longevity is to make it a lifestyle, to not get burnt out on it, right? And to have looking at your your maybe your calendar year or your month and your week and breaking it down that way and injecting or um yeah injecting like little periods of time where you have focus on longevity enhancing protocols like you know maybe you're throwing down like right now i'm running some peptides i'm running bpc and tb500 on a on a knee injury um because i'm not lifting as heavy as i was i can do like a 24-hour fast once a week or i can um you know do and, and pair a detox protocol with that where maybe i'm getting in the sauna and I'm you know, drinking lots of water, doing like, I don't know, a coffee enema that day or something like that. Um, but if you go too far in, in one direction, you know, like you, or if you spend too much time in one of these pathways, it's almost like the law of diminishing returns kicks in. Yeah. So you got to be really clear on your goal, understand what it is that you want, and then create a lifestyle that is conducive for reaching that goal, but also is fun and exciting and it doesn't feel hard or like work. Or if it does feel hard, you're you're sweat you're having you're pulsing it, right? So that's why when I work with my clients, it's very individual. Um, everybody's different. There's no diet that works for everybody. There's no exercise. It's really what do you want right now, right? And 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 let's work towards that from a bunch of different areas. I, you know, the way I think about things is it's mental, it's emotional, it's nutritional, it's exercise, it's movement, it's relationship, it's all that stuff. So let's let's map out one step at a time what your next step looks like for where you're at because and that changes right so like the thing that i see the most that kind of irks me in the in the in our space and the health and wellness is like nutrition right like you can't you can't put two people in a room with with knives and and uh have them talk about nutrition without killing themselves right like it's such a hot topic but like what i say is somebody's in a hole right and they they get out of it because they did a vegan diet or a, you know, a keto diet or a carnivore diet or whatever. And they become evangelical about it. And they think this is the only ways what everybody needs to do. So now they're, they're shooting on their friends. They're shooting on themselves. Maybe they're ignoring their intuition to eat more carbs or to have some plants or to, to have some meat because things change. Right. So like, that's what I've had to, because I've, I've so many times I've hit my head. Well, yeah, I have, but I, I've hurt myself and my health trying to stick with something for too long thinking that hey this thing that worked today i've got now it's got to be in every day right so like i'll give you an example real quick like right now i'm coming off the trt right so bro, bro this is as close as i'm ever going to get to menopause as a man right like night sweats i'm um i'm hot hot flashes well pregnenolone or no excuse me progesterone can really help that women that are in menopause they'll use pre progesterone we did my labs recently saw that progesterone was low okay so last night knowing that I took a little bit put it on slept great does that mean i need it tonight no it means i feel a lot better today and i'm going to push it in the past i would have attached myself to the supplement to the diet to the exercise to the person and said like i need this all the time 
Yeah. When it, and, and I get that. I think that's kind of a, a trauma response. And even working through the the feeling of I need these things, I need these supplements to 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 be my best. Yeah, maybe you do right now, but let's see what happens in the next three to six months. And I think that's where a lot of people hurt themselves or go backwards or or, or kind of dig a hole is not knowing when to pivot. And that's why having a coach like yourself um, to kind of have that 10,000 foot view and go, Hey, you're going, a good coach knows when to push and when to hold you back while always empowering you um, to make the decisions from your own intuition. Yeah. I think that's, that's perfect. I think a lot of people need to hear that. Um, And I, you know, when you were talking earlier about like, you've tried certain things and you've like been evangelical about like maybe fasting or even like, you know, keto in the past, like, it's good that you have these experiences and and it's good that, you know, I've got, I've got experiences like that. I've tried pretty much every, I've used myself as a lab rat as well. Um, and I've, you know, I've, I've worked with tons of different people. Um, and so like what we can do now with our experiences and our experiences helping others is like you said, help people make those pivots with, with wherever they're at. Cause say yeah. someone, you know, they're doing low carb um, for a while to, to reach a certain goal you know, maybe they reach that goal and they're like, okay, well now, now what I do, like maybe low carb doesn't get me to my, my next phase that I'm trying to reach. And so like helping them figure out like, okay, now that you have done low carb, we've gotten you to a level of leanness that you've been looking for. Now we're trying to kind of recomp, maybe build, um, reverse diet, build some muscle, yeah. like shift focus here. Yeah. Um, so, so it's kind of like having that guiding light, knowing when to pivot. And a lot of that comes from experience. So like people like you and me, where we've tried everything under the sun, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend the the regular person to do that, but maybe, <laughs> maybe have someone like us, like tell you what's worked, like tell you where you might want to go with where you're at now. Um, and then like, just ha- have some sort of a guiding light. Uh, and then you might know a better idea of where to go and where to pivot um, yeah. when you're making those changes. But I think, I think the pivot thing is huge. I think that's what people don't realize because they think like, I'm going to do this to get where I want to go. That's what's going to work forever. Um, and like things are going to change, right? It's like, I, maybe you're super into powerlifting at one point and you are like all about like lifting super heavy. Maybe like you said, like you get, you get a knee injury. That's not going to be your thing now, right? Mm-hmm. You're, you're not going to be like trying to max out on squats all the time. Um, mm-hmm. So maybe like, you know, a period of hypertrophy for your, for your legs um, to build up the muscle around the knees, strengthen things up. Maybe in the future you can get back to it. But for right now, like I wouldn't say like maxing out on squats would be the best thing for, for someone like you or someone going through an injury or something like that. So like, yeah. And if you got tunnel vision, right. And, and that's all, you know, you don't, you don't see any other options that creates a lot of stress. And ultimately what we're doing for people is we're saving them time and stress time is the only non-renewable resource that you have right and like i wish i had a me 20 years ago right (laughs) um and i'm so thankful for the journey i wouldn't take anything back but ultimately that's what we're doing is saving time and it's like what makes that even hard as a coach these days i'm sure you'll agree with this is like all the information right and so you like i'll give you an example of a guy last year had come to me and um he yo-yoed a lot lost and gained and you know but he lost all this weight with keto. Okay. And so he was, I want to do, that's how I'm going to do it. I'm like, why are you hiring me? You know? So I, we, we track his food. We see where he's at, you know, my man is eating. And this is what I see commonly when people are a hundred pounds more overweight that need to lose it. Unfortunately, they're eating a, a very low calorie. Right. And so he's eating 800. He's trying to diet. He's doing everything that I can, that he can. And, and that's awesome. A lot of willpower there. And I'm like, I can work with that with, if you can work this hard with what you got going on, like this is going to be easy, but the whole letting go of how he wanted to do it. Like we had to reverse diet him for a couple of months to get those calories up. That's a really tough sell for someone that's overweight because you're going to gain weight until yep. your metabolism corrects. Um, and we don't know when it's going to correct, right? We're just looking for signs. And so that is when it gets tough um, in a relationship is when someone is really attached and set on doing it a certain way, like they've done it before that they're evangelical about. And now they're working with a professional and they can't, I don't like the word submit, but they can't be coached. Mm-hmm. They're not ready to be coached. If that makes sense. Yeah. I think that it's dangerous with some of these fad diets or like really restrictive diets that are out there these days. It's like, you know, people get really 
um, caught up in doing that, but it's just so hard to stick to. And that's what causes that flip flop a lot of times, you know, if, caused, if you, sorry, I mean, you're not too. no, you're good. Yeah. I'm just saying like, you know, you, they'll, they'll try something super restricted for a really long time or for a certain period of time. Um, and it's, they just can't stick to it. And that causes them to just be like dieting doesn't work. And then they gain a bunch of weight and it's kind of just up and down. Um, yeah, that's, that's a really, that's one of the worst things is like trying something that it, bro, if you've got a symptom or, or, or a diagnosis, there's a product that somebody's going to sell you for it. Right. Yeah. Or a way of eating. And I was, I fell, I, I, that messed me up in so many ways and it, it caused a lot of disordered eating had I not had some good people around me where there's times where I was afraid of every macronutrient, every food you can imagine, you know, the carnivore people say, don't eat fiber, you know, don't eat plants. Now they're eating fruit. And, and, and I, and I learned a lot from doing that diet, you know, yeah. the, the, the I, I, everything, and they all have something good to learn from it and they can be a tool in the tool belt. So I'm not knocking any of them. Um, and, and the way that I eat is a combination of all the things that I've learned from that. Right. right? And it changes. Um, but if, but it can, I mean, I was afraid of carbs. I was afraid of vegetables. I was afraid of fiber. I was afraid of meat. I was afraid of, I mean, you, you name it. And, and yeah, when, when you try those things and you end up hurting yourself more and dig yourself further into the hole and you feel like there's no options for you, man, that is a, a scary place to be. For sure. Yeah. I think with all that information, the, the best thing someone can do is get a foundation of knowledge, like learn the, the pillars, like what's, what are the real needle movers and in my opinion, you know, you spoke on it with, with your training kind of philosophy. I think resistance training, strength training is like, you know, you want to prioritize that, um, you know, exercise wise, uh, diet wise, you know, calories in calories out, that's going to determine your weight gain or weight loss, right? That's, that's number one. Um, and then, you know, getting a base knowledge of your protein, carbs, and fat, I would say protein is the most important macro. Um, and then carbs and fat aren't as important, but that's, what's going to determine kind of the fuel for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, I would say nutrient timing is less important. It's on top, you know, kind of getting towards the top of the pyramid. And then supplementation is like the very tippy top. And I feel like a lot of people are so concerned with, with what's at the top, not as important. Like they're like, what, what supplement should I take? You know, when, when should I eat when it's like, well, let's take control uh, and kind of like build our foundation, like get the get the the basics under control make sure we have a good uh set of pillars with everything that's going to be the real needle movers before we worry about any of that other stuff that's yeah, what i like and, to say a lot of times and with the whole supplement thing that's where i started i started just taking a shit ton of supplements back in the day <laughs> but but now that's why i really love working with uh functional medicine doctors and it depends on the person right if there's more of like a, a symptoms and diseases stuff kind of going on then we need to go get some blood work and, and look under the hood and see what's going on but yeah. it really comes down to to meeting people where they're at, making it as simple as possible and giving them like a, it's, it's, it's what, whatever they can handle right now without being too much. It needs to be simple. It needs to be easy to execute. And then you build that momentum, you build that confidence. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, then it's like, you know, just keep taking steps and adding more things in or, or taking things away, whatever that may be for you. And right. Filling out what works, filling out what feels good for you. What's maintainable. Yeah. hundred percent. And I like the, I, I was going to say tools in the toolbox. Cause I think that's a lot of the stuff that we've learned from, from whether it was, you know, a good thing or a bad thing, we've got so many tools in the toolbox and we've got so many things to help others, you know, point them in the right direction and everything like that. So. so oh I yeah. I always say I'm 10 miles deep and two inches wide. Like, <laughs> uh, you know, and we, when I get on these podcasts, I never know what the hell we're going to talk about because, and I, I'm just fascinated with this stuff. It, it's amazing. Yep. Uh, there's so many options. There's so many fun things. And, and that's what I would say is, just follow your intu intuition. It's a, it's a hell yes, or it's a no, man, do what feels good and right. go in that direction, learn what you can there. And then you know, integrate that into your uh, daily practice. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely, man. So um, on the Elevate Everyday podcast, I've asked every guest this, um, what would you, cause we're all about, you know, not just listening, but putting this stuff, you know, into action right away. So what would you like to challenge the listeners to after listening to this, like put into action? What's one simple thing they should put into action? You know, I would say um, I, I'm going to take from Irene something I've learned in her class. And that's, uh, you know, when these different emotions come in, can you name them, right? Can you locate a sensation in your body? 
instead of when that anxiety comes up, when that even aches and pains and things like that, the symptoms, whatever it is that's, that's nagging you, everybody has that thing. When that comes in, instead of trying to push it away or numb it, can you, can you welcome it, invite it as a friend? Can you sit with it? And, and here's, a, here's one thing you could do. Lay on the ground, like face down, uh, you know, turn your phones off and stuff like that. So you're just with yourself and just locate in your body where that sensation is. I'm going to go with anxiety. So anxiety for me, it may feel like staticky. It may feel like a, a dark, nasty coat that's, that I'm weighing over my shoulders. Uh, I had a client the other day tell me he's holding and carrying all this stress on his shoulders, right? Yeah. And so, okay, great. That's awesome. So thank you for being here. Um, what do you want to say? What does it want to say, right? What does it need to do? How does it want to express itself? Do you want to move in a certain way? Do you want to, uh, you know, yuck? You know, do you want to say something? Do you want to express something? Do you want to push something away? Do you want to, whatever that may be. And so the more we can learn to be with those symptoms, the more we learn ourselves. we learn, oh, you know what? When I get stressed, I carry, I carry it in my neck, right? And so if I'm carrying it in my neck, okay, well, what does it want to say? What's it there for? Maybe where did it come from? At what age was it there? That's, an, that's even a deeper question. But if I was doing the neck thing, I would just say, can I relax it? What would it take to relax it? So maybe I need to tense it and relax. Um, you can do the same thing with, um, with the anxiety. I tend, to, I tend to use tapping, EFT, emotional freedom technique. Now, that may be another podcast for us. But I'll do some tapping to help kind of process that. Um, I, I could walk you through that another time. And then I, when I come, I find the emotion, I understand where it wants, where it came from and uh, what it wants to say. And then I might just do like a journal on that. Yeah. And if there's, and if I feel like I haven't cleared that out, that's when I would go to a professional and say like, here's the two or three things that I've been working on. Like, let's talk about that. Yeah. I think I hope that's not too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. So yeah, I think kind of being aware of how your body's feeling you know just being more aware of, of what's going on sounds like your your challenge and then just like instead of what what I kind of got from that you know in the past if I if I was feeling super anxious or like just with whatever emotions I was feeling I'd I'd knowingly or unknowingly you know go to alcohol or like go to some coping mechanism um to to just feel better um from the way I'm feeling but just being aware and then doing it you know trying to to work on that in a more healthy way um, yeah. and I think for me, journaling has been like you mentioned, like super powerful. Um, so that's something I've talked about quite a bit. Um, in one, some of my podcasts. Uh, one thing I want to add to what you just said is, is so good. Like our immediate reaction is to like, go for the numbing thing, right? Yeah. Use your vices, use the things that comfort you. The goal is to eventually wean off of those crutches, right? Whether that's medication, cannabis for me, whatever that may be right. Use that. But before you reach for that thing that brings you comfort to help you regulate do it yourself, process that emotion, be clear, sit with it, and then go there if you feel like. And over time, what I've found is that you reach for those things less and less. And they're, again, they're just tools in the tool belt like we've been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I think one thing for me too, and this, this isn't even something I really talked about, but like, I think even sweets have been that for me in the past where like, you know, and I didn't even realize it, but just like if I was feeling a certain way and then yeah. I got a piece of cake, like I, I, there's been times I've eaten an entire cookie cake. <laughs> just, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's cool, man. Like sometimes, yeah. right. So like that's part indulgence is part. I talk about this a lot in my coaching, like indulgence is a part of a human behavior, but if you're doing it every day to numb yourself, that's a problem. Yeah. So I would say, yeah, go eat the whole cake. Enjoy that. Right. Don't judge yourself, but get back on track. And then over time you need it less and less when you're doing this work, it absolutely gets better. Your body wants to return to health. Yeah. Um, and the more you can love yourself along the way, I think that is, that's key. Yeah. And I, I think the awareness thing, because I, you know, I wasn't aware that like that was maybe an emotional thing with the sweets. Um, but now that like, you know, there's just that little bit of like, okay, I know that I'm, I'm kind of that way with sweets. And so now that when I see a piece of cake, like I'm, I'm there's just a different relationship. Yeah. <laughs> with yeah and you thing. can, and you can knowing that about yourself, you can say, okay, I know that my thing is I'm going to eat this whenever I, I feel like shit. Okay, well, what else can I do? Well, I can put some alternatives in there, yep. in the um, in the in the fridge or whatever. I can I can have that thing. I can have a small portion of it instead of beating myself up and telling myself what a piece of shit I am when I'm eating right. it. I can eat it with gratitude. I can yep. eat it with excitement. You know, it's like it's so funny. Our brain 
doesn't know the difference between thinking something and experiencing something. So if I'm beating myself up and eating a piece of cake and telling myself it's a bad food, well, my body's going to react. My immune system's going to go down. You know, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to have as much energy. But yeah. if I can eat that piece of cake and just be stoked about it, I had a hard workout. I ate my cake. Uh, you know, that's my delayed direct gratification to get my <laughs> dopamine hit later in the day. I waited all week to do that. Yo, that's a, that's a, that's a check mark, dude. That's a, that's a, that's a healthy way of processing everyday life. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And even something I'm like told to my clients and, and done for myself is like, you know, maybe you have something healthy right before you do that, like that little moment of awareness. Um, and then when you have the cake, like it, it feels more like it's, you're just enjoying it rather than like, I need the cake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it may not even, it's funny when you, you mentioned fasting earlier, like when you start eating healthy, especially fasting, good food just tastes so much better. So like and yeah. it, it overrides, you know, you talk about sweets, it overrides the pleasure centers in our brain, the dopamine, the serotonin, like all these things are just going through the roof. They're these hyper palliative foods that like we don't find in nature. So of course you're going to crave that, but you know, it also has a, a, a feedback loop, like a side effect, right? So the more aware of yourself that you can be and the more that you go, I think the more you work in some of these healthy habits, some of those crutches and those vices, they just don't seem as attractive anymore. But Man. when you do get to have them every now and then, you're like, damn, this is awesome. No, wow, I, I forgot how good Ben and Jerry's was, but I don't need it every night. Yeah, no, man, I was going to wrap this thing up, but that that is something huge. That That's something I've been talking about a lot recently is like when you kind of delay that gratification, it makes it more enjoyable when you do have these things, like for sure. There, it's not just um, like a, like we're not just saying, there's literally like more chemical reward Mm -hmm. systems in your brain yeah like you're getting yeah. more reward from it when you don't have it all the time like if yeah you know if if you have cake every single day you're literally not going to get the same feeling from from having that but like if you know if you eat healthy and then every once in a while you intermittently have these good things it's more it's way more enjoyable like literally there's more going on in your brain to reward yourself from those enjoyable things yeah. when when you don't have it all the time so. and that's a, and that's a mindfulness practice of being present with that cake that you delayed until the end of the week and you work so hard and you're going to enjoy, you're not going to slam it down and just go, Oh, you know, it's, Oh man, every bite is amazing. I work so hard for this. I'm celebrating. That's a big part of my client stuff is when we have a win, we want to acknowledge it. We write it down. I have a book of proof and then we celebrate it. So they go, would you, would you do great? What, what was the big win you had this week? And well, this is my win. Okay, cool. How are you going to celebrate? Right. Yeah. And it could be that piece of cake and, it, and okay. Awesome be very present with that piece of cake, enjoy every single bite, savor yeah. it, and then get back to work. hundred yeah. percent. Awesome, man. Well, cool. Well, what, what's next for you, Mitch? Like what, what's in the works for you? Like what, um, what would you like to promote or just what are you working on? Yeah. So uh, my one-on-one -on -one coaching is, is always going on. Uh, what month is it? Let's see. It's, we got uh, oh, September coming up. So I've got a couple of slots starting in September. Uh, any of your clients that are, uh, listeners that are interested can hit me up for a free consult. You know, I'm not going to try to sell you anything. Uh, we'll just talk about your goals and see if we're a good fit. And the thing that I've got coming up in the next couple of months, I'm going to be doing um, a, a one time a month, like a membership type, type deal of like a Q and a where people can pop on, they can uh, ask some questions. We can take a deep dive, kind of picking it apart, looking at it from, you know, a holistic standpoint, mental, emotional, nutrition, exercise, lifestyle, biohacking, quantum physics, uh, and uh, you know and just just uh, have some fun kind of kind of chatting it up a little bit so that's that's coming you can catch me on my website mitchweb.com and i'm on linkedin and i'm on instagram awesome yeah, well, awesome sir well i appreciate you coming on the on the podcast mitch um and thank you for the listeners for tuning in i know you guys got a lot of value i'm sure you you probably have some questions we went on a little bit of tangents here and there <laughs> but Sorry. guys Thanks for listening to the Elevate Everyday Podcast. Um, stay tuned. Smash the like button. Smash the subscribe button for expert guests every single week. Um, and I'll see you guys in the next video. But in the meantime, elevate every damn day, guys. Peace. Elevate. Only obligation is to tell it straight.